Hi, I'm Opossum and I find garbage. Today's garbage is The Tomorrow War, the new Chris Pratt sci-fi movie on Amazon Prime. I didn't like it. I liked the movie up until about 50 minutes in when we see the monsters for the first time and tonal issues and plot holes start to become apparent. But I can't really talk about the problems without explaining what happens, so the rest of this video is just going to be spoilers. Now the movie is included with Amazon Prime without any additional fees or anything, so if you have an account and two hours to spare, there's no reason not to watch it first. So if you care, then go ahead and watch the movie, then come back to hear what I have to say about it. But if you don't care and you haven't seen the movie, I'm just going to go ahead and explain what happens real quick, and then I'll tell you what's wrong with it, right? So here we go. The movie starts with Chris Pratt at a Christmas party with his wife's tuna Santa, and they're all watching the World Cup or something. During the middle of the game, these soldiers pop out of a portal and tell the whole world about a war that's with the aliens in the future. We get a montage of news clips telling us about how the world's governments decided to work together to fight the future war, but after the world's militaries got wiped out, they start conscripting civilians by the millions, and only something like one in five make it back alive after a one-week tour. We cut to a year later when Chris Pratt is talking to his science class, but other kids are interested because they all figure they're going to die anyway. And there's this one kid who's obsessed with volcanoes. After the class, Chris Pratt gets a message on his phone telling him to report to some place to confirm his draft status. So Chris Pratt goes to take a test, and it turns out he's eligible, so they attach a thing to his arm which can send him in, you know, forward and back through time. He tells his wife, and he tells, uh, she tells him to ask his crazy doomsday prepper father to help him take the arm thing off so they could run and hide. Chris Pratt reluctantly goes to his father, J.K. Simmons, for help, but then they get again an argument about him abandoning his family, so Chris Pratt gets mad at him and leaves the, with the thing still on his arm. He goes and tells his daughter he's going to war, and then we cut to him meeting with the people he's going to be going to war with, and he gets his five minutes of training. Sometime later, an alarm goes off, and it turns out uh, one of the last laboratories in the future who's studying the monsters is under attack, so they have to travel to the future now. But then there's some kind of miscalculation, and everyone ends up teleported into the sky, and they all fall to their deaths except for Chris Pratt and a handful of important characters who land in a rooftop swimming pool. The commander lady tells them on the radio to make their way to a laboratory to find a bunch of vials which they need for some reason. So Chris Pratt, who's actually a combat veteran, and this other guy take charge and lead everyone to the lab. But then they have to hurry because the uh, Air Force is about to carpet bomb the city. They go to the lab, they find the vials, but then the monsters show up and everyone starts getting picked off. Chris Pratt and four other people just barely escape the city as it blows up, and they wakes up on a military base somewhere in the Dominican Republic. Chris Pratt then meets the commander lady, who turns out to be his daughter, who's all grown up now. Commander Lady takes him on a mission to capture a female monster so they can study it because the females, which are bigger and stronger than the males, are apparently immune to the toxin they've been using to fight the monsters. So they capture the female and escape with uh, the, uh, the other monsters chase them. The Commander Lady tells Chris Pratt at some point that between the time be that he went to the future and now he abandoned her, just like his father abandoned him, and then he died in a car crash. And it's this big emotional moment, even though she didn't seem all that emotional before about seeing her dead father for the first time in years, or whatever. They go to some laboratory in the middle of the ocean where, where the time machine is, and they start studying the female monster until they discover the toxin that will work on it. But then the monsters attack. Commander Lady gets killed just as Chris Pratt gets sent back in time, because conveniently, it just happened to be at the end of his tour. And he tells the military people he has a toxin which they need to mass produce to send to the future to fight the monsters. But they tell him the time machine was destroyed just after he came back, so now they can't. Chris Pratt goes home and everyone acts like the war is lost and they're all doomed. But then Chris Pratt's wife comes up with the idea of finding the alien spaceship before the war even starts. Because nobody ever thought of that for some reason. Chris Pratt gets a monster claw from the guy he went to war with. And they find that it has traces of volcanic ash on it. And they ask the kid from his science class earlier, to, who somehow figures out the exact location of the spaceship based on this information. Chris Pratt goes to his father and asks him for help, 
and they just happen to have access to this big military plane. So they fly to Russia and find an alien spaceship buried under the ice. They go inside and find a dead alien, which doesn't look like the others. The reason, and they reason that these uh, aliens are transporting the monster somewhere. Now the aliens generally act like mindless animals, so they obviously wouldn't be capable of building spaceships. So I figured they were some kind of weaponized animal brought to Earth by smarter aliens. So this twist didn't really surprise me. Uh, they find one of the rooms with the monsters in stasis and start injecting them with the toxin, which they replicated at some point. But then they, they all start waking up. This guy sacrifices himself to blow up the spaceship, but then it, it turns out one of the, the females escaped and they have to kill it before it lays eggs. So Chris Pratt and uh, his father chase the female monster and manage to stick it with the toxin, killing it. So they successfully prevented the war. Chris Pratt's father meets his granddaughter, then the movie ends. Now, the plot of this movie has a lot of problems, and I don't just mean like surface level nitpicks. I mean the entire premise of the movie doesn't make sense. Okay, so the way the time travel works, they explain it with the analogy of two rafts floating on a river. The river, which is time, constantly flows in one direction, and so do the rafts, which represent moments. You can jump back and forth between these rafts, but not before or after. So if you go to the future and spend a week there, when you go back to the past, you can only go back to one week after you left because your rafts in time have both moved one week down the river. So if you spend a week in the future, you're gone for a week in the past. Get it? So basically, the events of the future are happening in real time relative to the past, if that makes sense. So if there's some kind of urgency in the future, it becomes urgent in the past because you can't just travel to a time in between to deal with it or prevent it. Because of this, even though they have to conscript people from the civilian population, they can't take any time to train them. So anyone who doesn't already have combat training is basically just cannon fodder with little to no hope of survival. That's why they only conscript people who, according to records from the future, will already be dead before the war starts 28 years later. So if they could find your future obituary saying you die sometime between now and then, you're drafted because you're gonna die anyway. So here's what I'm wondering. Instead of drafting millions of untrained people from the civilian population and sending them to the deaths in the future, why not just have the entire civilian population spend the next 28 years preparing for war? Since people in the future know the aliens first appear somewhere in Russia, why don't they just tell people in the past to build up defenses around that part of Russia and just nuke the aliens when they show up? At one point, it's explained that the future people never sent any photos or videos of the monsters back in time because if people in the past knew what they were up against, everyone would resist the draft and they wouldn't be able to get anyone to fight, the you know, fight them in the future. Now, that works for the sake of making the monsters seem scarier to the audience, because it's following the screenplay logic of not revealing the monsters too early, thus building suspense and making us fill the gaps with our imagination. But by the same token, wouldn't that just have the, uh, the same effect within the logic of the story world? Nobody in the past knows what the monsters look like, so wouldn't that just make people think they're even scarier than they really are, and thus even more likely to resist the draft? You're telling people to fight an enemy they know literally nothing about, other than it's apparently so dangerous that it's threatening to cause the extinction of the human race. That doesn't exactly inspire confidence. Uh, things tend to become less scary the more you know about them, right? I mean, there was a time when people were so afraid of bears that they thought that saying the word would summon one. But now we know how they behave and how to fend them off, so most people aren't worried about them. So if you can just send people and objects back in time, why not just send all of your data on these monsters back in time so scientists and private enterprises can learn as much about them before the war starts as you know, they can learn their weaknesses and prepare to fight them? Furthermore, you mean to tell me that out of all the millions of people who have been sent to the future to fight these monsters in the future war, not one of the survivors who came back has taken the time to describe one of the monsters or draw a picture of one? I mean, this isn't a nitpick. This is the entire premise of the movie. The whole story is built around the idea that people in the future need to get people from the past to travel in time to fight these monsters, but they won't tell them anything about them. It's idiotic. Then later, after creating a toxin that can kill the aliens, Chris Pratt's scientist daughter, yeah, the commander lady, she's also a scientist, 
she tells him to take the toxin with him back into the past when they still had the equipment to mass produce it, and then send a huge amount of it back to the future so they could fight the aliens. But it turns out the time machine was destroyed shortly after Chris Pratt went back to the past, so there's no way to send the toxin to the future, so everyone just concludes the war is lost. But you don't need a time machine to send something to the future. If you want to send something to the future, literally all you have to do is store it somewhere and wait. They could just spend the next 28 years stockpiling the toxin, then just, put, just pull it out when the war starts and they have a massive head start over the aliens. These aren't things that I thought up in the shower after watching the movie. I was thinking about these things as I was watching it and wondering why my questions weren't being answered. And since they weren't answered, the only conclusion is that the writers didn't think of them. So since I was able to pick up on these logical flaws in the movie, and they were never addressed in the movie, I just sat there the whole time wondering if and when they would be addressed, but they never were, so I was taken out of the movie for most of the runtime. It's kind of hard to get emotionally invested in a movie when you're sitting there wondering why the characters are failing to see obvious solutions, and you're just questioning the general logic of it all. And just because I know some idiot will bring up this argument, my problem is not that it's unrealistic. I obviously don't expect realism in a movie about aliens and time travel. The problem is logical inconsistency and a lack of answers to things I shouldn't even be wondering about. Even movies about space wizards have to make sense according to their own internal logic. If you know something as bad is going to happen in the future, you don't need a time machine to prepare for it. So it makes no sense that everyone just gives up because they don't have one. Now, I kind of wish they didn't show the aliens because they spend the first 50 minutes or so hyping up how horrifying the future is. And a character even explains that they don't send photos of the aliens back in time because everyone would resist the draft if they saw them. You know, if they did a bird box sort of a thing where the audience never sees the monsters and their appearance was just kind of left to our imagination, they would have been a lot scarier. But it turns out they're basically just big lizards and our action heroes kill them by the hundreds. So the movie builds up these monsters as the scariest thing ever but then it almost instantly deflates them shortly after they first appear because now we know they're just dumb animals who run around and eat people, like countless other movie monsters. And I get why they did that, it's an action movie, so we need to see our heroes shooting at something, but it just made me wish they went for more of a horror tone, where the aliens are just more mysterious and we only ever see the aftermath of their attacks or something. And that's basically what they did for the time between the start of the second act up until maybe about 20 minutes later. I, I actually really liked that part of the movie, but then they reveal the monsters and it just turns out it just turns into a series of people running around and shooting. The worst character in the movie is Charlie, the fat, cowardly, bumbling comic relief. He reminds me of Marlon Wayans character in Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know why they felt the need to include a comic relief because all he does is ruin the tone of every scene he's in. I know comic reliefs aren't new, but it seems like ever since the MCU, every big movie now feels the need to undercut these the tense and dramatic moments by throwing in some stupid comedy which isn't even funny most of the time. And I don't understand why. This isn't a kid's movie. And understand, the issue isn't that this is comedy at all in the movie, because even good movies like Predator have comedy moments. The problem is that the movie doesn't seem to know when to use comedy and when not to. And that seems to be an increasingly common problem in movies. The worst example comes during the stairwell scene, when the monsters are first revealed and everyone is running away. What should be a tense and scary scene is turned into a cartoony farce by Charlie comedically yelling sh** over and over while running and shooting. The movie is trying to make us laugh during the, the first big action scene involving the monsters. So the movie is basically telling us not to take them seriously, even though they're the main threat and source of conflict, and thus we shouldn't take the movie itself seriously. I shouldn't be laughing during the reveal of the big scary threat that's meant to be the linchpin of your whole movie. I mean, I wasn't laughing because it wasn't funny, but the movie wanted me to laugh. The movie wanted me to mentally associate the monsters with clown antics. I just don't get why every big movie now feels the need to force an awkward comedy where it doesn't fit. And the only reason I could think of is the MCU does it, and those movies are consistently successful at the box office, so now every big movie has to be like a Marvel movie. So Chris Pratt is mad at his dad for abandoning him, 
but his, his, his dad explains that he did so because he has PTSD from the Vietnam War and made him unable to manage his anger, so he left to avoid hurting his family. But Chris Pratt doesn't accept that explanation and refuses his help. So I guess Chris Pratt would rather go to war than accept help from his dad, so he doesn't get the arm thing taken off and ends up going to the future where he meets his now adult daughter, who's mad at him because at some point after he got back from the war, he abandoned her. So there's this ham-fisted thematic parallel between Chris Pratt being mad at his father for abandoning him and Chris Pratt's daughter being mad at him for the same reason. The movie wants us to believe Chris Pratt develops PTSD because of his tour in the future war and that eventually causes him to abandon his family, but he never really acts like he has PTSD. On the contrary, he's all, he's all gung-ho about finding the spaceship and blowing it up. And then Chris Pratt's father, who is also supposed to have PTSD, decides to join him as they travel to Russia to find the spaceship and fight the aliens. So now the theme about parental abandonment and forgiveness is clashing with the tone. The movie wants to be about how horrible war is and how it affects people, which is a really dark and realistic subject, but at the same time, it still wants to do the summer action blockbuster thing and have this big dumb heroic ending where everything works out in the end. The movie is trying to be the deer hunter and Independence Day at the same time, and it doesn't work. Now, if you just want to look at The Tomorrow War as a big dumb summer action movie like Independence Day, which you watch with your brain turned off and just enjoy the ride, then this movie is fine in that regard, I guess. But if you're one of these people who like to pretend a movie is smarter than it really is just because it has themes, then you'll look like an idiot for defending this one. So I guess that's all I have to say about The Tomorrow War. Like, comment, subscribe, support me on Patreon. Bye.